Fiery crash in Florida caught on a ring camera. Airlines are back, or are they? And stuck mic means trouble for one pilot out there. All on today's episode, Taking Off. Hi, I'm Dan Milliken, and let's get right to it for the latest aviation news. On March 15th, a Bonanza crashed in Pembroke Pines, Florida. Most of you have seen the horrific ring camera footage of the crash. And the two occupants of the, on the plane, as well as a four-year-old in the SUV, were killed in this tragedy. There is very little data on this crash, and I'm not going to speculate. Scott Perdue over at Flywire has a very good analysis on this crash, so check it out. But what we do know for sure is this. The plane was clearly in a stall when it crashed. It was not flying. There was not enough airflow across the wings to generate lift. There's only one reason for a structurally intact airplane to lose airflow over the wings, and that's a stall which, short of cables snapping from the yoke, is pilot-caused. This is the story we're hearing over and over again and the foundation for the grassroots AQP general aviation training that is gaining steam. When you lose thrust, you must pitch for best glide. For all you pilots out there watching, do you even know what your best glide speed is in your plane? Well, mine is 85 knots in my 210. Loss of power? Pitch for 85. It's a mantra. For Christy and her Wong Warrior, ask her. She'll tell you without missing a beat. 73. What's yours? We've got to know this number. An AQP recommends putting a small piece of tape on your airspeed indicator for your defined minimum maneuvering speed. Great idea. We've got to fly the airplane all the way to the crash site. If you pull up because the ground is coming closer, you might cause the plane to fall from the sky. Even if all you have is trees in front of you or power lines or whatever, if you pull up, you'll probably fall. If you fall out of the sky, you will die. If you glide, still flying into trees or power lines, you might die, but you might live. If you fall, you'll die. I don't think I can say this enough. So what's the answer? Practice, then practice, and practice. I know earlier in my flying, I got myself into a bad situation on a short, unimproved field and decided a little late to go around. I was in some grass trying to pull that yoke up, and this is not the answer. You need appropriate airspeed for an airplane to fly, for the airflow to generate that life-giving lift. In an emergency, you will digress to your lowest level of training. And if you haven't practiced an engine out, setting best glide, then you're going to succumb to base human instinct, which will most likely be to pull up and away from the ground. Then you fall and you die. And this is what I want to take away from this accident. And also, it's a great time to talk about the impossible turn. I mean, we don't know for sure that's what happened to this bonanza in Florida, but let's talk about the impossible turn. Pretty soon, Russ Still from Gold Seal and I are going to do a video on this, but in the meantime, here are just some facts about the impossible turn. First, for those who don't know, I'm talking about the turn back to the airport you've just taken off from, usually due to engine failure. For all those macho-driven people that are super pilots, Han Solos like I was, I told myself anything above 500 feet AGL and it was on. And honestly, I knew inside I could do it even lower because I'm such a great pilot. Well, the two guys in the Bonanza, they were great pilots, but physics don't care how many hours you've logged. Physics don't care how great your skills are. Sure, I can point to some YouTuber who was able to easily perform the impossible turn with a Cub engine neutral at 500 feet and preach to the world it's totally doable. But I implore you to rethink it as I did after I watched a similar video of someone practicing and preaching it and decided to look into it for myself. Look, lots of points that aren't usually brought into these videos by pilots talking about how doable it is, like the simple little fact demonstrating it by pulling back the throttle is not the same as a windmilling propeller from an engine out. Some say it gives you about 20% extra on reduced drag and all that kind of stuff. So a guy doing the maneuver for you at 500 feet really is more like 600 when you add that 20%. And that's just one thing rarely mentioned. There's a bunch of other things. And here's what I concluded after some study where I removed my ego from the equation. If I have a blanket rule for the impossible turn, like I'll do it at 500 feet AGL or whatever, 
then I am wrong. Don't do a blanket rule. Why? Because a successful turn back to the airport is based on a whole bunch of very important variables that will change with the weather, the airports, the planes you have. A turn back to the field will be easier on a cold day than a hot August Texas day. Slight crosswind? Well, a left turn back to the field might be death, where a right turn might give you a little help. It all depends, and it needs to be a part of your pre take off briefing every time and not just a blanket personal minimum. This research I did changed the way I take off and climb now. I consider the climb to a thousand feet to be the red zone. I'm hyper vigilant. I've pre-briefed what is in front of me and what is the best option for an emergency landing straight ahead. Every takeoff, every airport, every plane, Anyway, there's a lot more to talk about for the impossible turn, and we'll do that soon with Russ from Gold Seal. But if there's one thing you can take away from this horrible Florida tragedy, pre-brief a straight-ahead emergency landing in the event of loss of thrust. Are you someone that disagrees and will make that 500-foot turn back every time? Well, tell me about it in the comments. All right, next story. Is airline traffic back? Well, news is hitting about numbers being back and how good it is for the industry. Specifically, American Airlines just this week announced that they will reactivate most of its aircraft in the second quarter. As of this past weekend, TSA reported the highest amount of travelers since the pandemic started well over a year ago. American also announced 80% load capacities, which are close to pre-pandemic levels. However, they're only flying about 60% of the flights compared to back then. But here's the linchpin in the whole airline recovery, business travel. As someone who has flown some commercial air in the past few weeks, what I witnessed was pretty full flights, but it was like pre-pandemic weekend flying during the week. Families, kids, babies, people in walkers. Leisure travel is strong. People who've been cooped up or taking advantage of the low fares and heading out to visit grandma or grandma heading back out to visit the grandkids. That's what I'm seeing. Weekend travel in the middle of the week. But for the airlines to truly recover, business travel has to return. It's the bread and butter of the airline business. And what corporations discovered through the pandemic was that employees staying home were actually more productive in many cases. And Zoom calls became an acceptable alternative to booking that airline and hotel travel, let alone the liability of putting an employee in the air and in the hotels on company business only to have them contract COVID. Business travel is going to be slower on coming back. Disagree? Well, let me know in the comments. All right. Speaking of airlines coming back, while American reported reactivating, Southwest Airlines announced a huge 737 purchase, including the 737 MAX from Boeing. While a lot of people make jokes and criticize Southwest for putting their eggs all in one basket, it's why Southwest is perennially one of the highest rated carriers and one of the best financially. They didn't lay off employees like all the other airlines. They don't have to spend a ton of resources on different planes and equipment and training and logistics. It's smart business. And not so smart business was the Southwest Airlines flight in Oakland with the hot stuck mic. I'm not going to play that for you because it would just be a bunch of bleeps, but you can check it out at Vass Aviation's page if you want to hear it. But let's just say there's uh, probably an opening on the flight deck for a pilot at Southwest. Do I think that's right? Who knows? He was blowing off steam, and you know, I've had a mic stuck on me before several times. And one time I was joking with my passengers while unknowingly talking to center. Yeah, one of my most embarrassing moments in the air. Fortunately for me, I didn't say anything that would get me in trouble other than just being an idiot. And that's not news to anyone who knows me anyway. All right. Finally. In a maybe accidental early release of a blog on March 30th, website Sierra Hotel posted that Dublin, Ireland, 12th busiest airport in Europe, has decided to think outside the box and construct a circular runway to be finished by November of this year. So you'd better get your circular runway rating. Anyway, 
Happy early April 1st to you. <laughs> and that's the latest news in aviation. I hope you can take something away that makes you a better pilot and a better person. Oh, and by the way, I'm wearing the new blue color taking off t-shirt, which is Christy's favorite color. We also have the green, which is my favorite color. Order yours at takingoff.s-films store. And most of them I personally package and send off. And I really appreciate all you who have supported the channel in this way and also by joining the Hangar Club. And don't forget to get your 10% discount at Flying Eyes by using the Taking Off, all caps, discount code for great sunglasses. As a matter of fact, I got my prescription, just everyday prescription in the Kingfishers, and I wear them for my daily glasses. And it comes in handy when you're wearing those headphones with, with these thin frames. Ah, I love them. So that's it for today. Remember, superior judgment trumps superior skills. Right, Han Solo? See ya.